Hi, this is Chiezan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, for basic Buddhist teachings tonight, I thought I would go back to what I consider the most basic or foundational aspect of the path, which is meditation itself, the practice of zazen or shikantaza. And I was thinking about um, Sokazan's books. He has the two books published. And if you look at that, it's very indicative of what we're doing here as practitioners. There's 125 transcripts of how to practice shikantaza between the two books and eight Dharma talks. Eight Dharma talks talking about things ranging from the five skandhas, uh, looking at impulse, Meditation doesn't work, that's from the primer, but 125 different ways to talk about how to sit still and train the mind. And all of the teachings that have arisen through the Buddha's Dharma, they're countless. I don't know how long it would take if you tried to read any one of the canons front to back. But these teachings of, of the Buddha if they don't have the foundation of awareness, they just become uh, conceptual, not to be derogatory, but toys. They're just ideas that we can twist and turn and dissect, put together, take back apart, put back together again. But we're always stuck with the content. We're always just enamored, laminated to the philosophy, the ideology, the history, and again, valuable. We, we do not want to get rid of that. But it is in the context of seated meditation where we actually sit down and begin to look for ourselves that I feel that you can begin to penetrate the teachings, that you begin to see the teachings as a gateway, as an entry, as a starting point, and not as a finality that our fruition on the path is not just the conceptual understanding of how the Buddha's Dharma is talked about, but the intimacy that we begin to introduce ourselves to through our practice of meditation. And there's countless ways of practicing meditation. There's a lot of ways of practicing meditation going back to the time of the Buddha. The Buddha was not the inventor of meditation. There were many ways of looking at the mind, working with the mind, manipulating the mind. And even after the Buddha, we've seen countless ways in which practice has arisen in the formal sense, whether it's uh, body scanning, breath mindfulness, uh, creation completion, recitations of mantras, recitations of chants and sadhanas. But as Sokazana said, it's this practice of Zazen that is simultaneously the easiest form of meditation and the most difficult form of meditation. And while I know I'm talking to a lot of people that meditate probably every day or at least a few times a week, I've never ever heard Sokazan talk about meditation and felt, why doesn't he talk about something else? I know how to do that. Every time he talks about it, there's something magnetizing. There's something about that that feels so valuable. Because as we practice, we need the reminder to come back to the simplicity of practice because our minds elaborate. Our minds create more and more intricacies about meditation instead of seeing the simplicity of just holding still and being in your seat. So I'm going to give meditation instruction. I think so because I had the monks do this some time ago and I felt jealous. I felt left out. I didn't get to do it. So we, we start with the body. The body is our first reference point in meditation. It's tangible. We can find it. It's simple. We're with it every day. And it's important that in working with the body, that we work with it as a unique situation, that we don't try to replicate a particular body type. So the image of the Buddha is intimidating for some of us. It's very tight and folded and oftentimes without a cushion, or maybe 
a little bit of kusa grass or kusa, kusha grass. But you find a posture that you could say imitates or represents the intention of the mind. So the body is held very still and upright. It's attentive. We want to have some attention being paid to our surroundings. So the back is straight. Shoulders are coming down the back a little bit. And whether you're sitting on a chair, sitting in seiza posture, sitting cross-legged, Burmese, lotus, half lotus. And then the hands very simply resting on the thighs, resting on the knees or left over right with the thumbs touching in the lap. It's not too exotic. It's, it's a very simple thing to do with the body. And at the same time, because we have a good posture, it doesn't take a tremendous amount of effort in the back. And the attitude is universal, regardless of the sense field you're looking at. It's the simple instruction to receive. And I've brought that up before. That was my single instruction from Sokazan when we first met. He did not elaborate on how to meditate. He just kept repeating just receive. And I would ask a question. He would say, just receive. What is that? Just receive. How do you do that? Just receive. And he was giving me everything. It didn't need to be elaborated, but I wanted something more to chew on. So I kept pushing for more. And of course, in other situations, he gives what I feel are beautiful explications of how to meditate. Um, the third section of uh, the meditation primer is my favorite one to go back to. Thank you very much. I have no complaints about anything whatsoever. But the attitude of receiving is not differentiated by the senses. And that's difficult because the first five sense fields are straightforward. We know smell, taste, sound, touch, sight. And there is some degree of artificial objectivity in those because we can go to that. We can go to sight. We can go to smell. We can go to taste. And we can look at it. But we somehow take a different attitude towards the mind. We take a different attitude towards thoughts. And it really is that same simple instruction of just receiving. And when I say simple, it doesn't mean your thoughts are simple or that they feel good or that they um, provide some sort of relief or insight. It's simple in that there's no obligation to do anything with the thoughts. It's in that context when Sokazan says meditation is the most luxurious thing you can do. It's only in that context when you see what arises in the mind and the senses is not demanding anything of you, despite how you feel about it. And in that sense, it's very luxurious. It's perhaps one of the few times during the day where we have no obligation to perform, to produce, to interfere, to strategize. We are just given an opportunity to say, you actually don't have to do anything. And that not doing anything is receiving. It's that attentiveness of the body watching what arises and falls. And it's because of this attitude of receiving that so much can happen in meditation and it doesn't deviate from meditation. So the example of falling asleep that we hear about a lot, the reason that that can arise in meditation is because you're not trying to maintain a meditator. You're not trying to maintain a state of mind. You're not trying to grasp onto something that we, this is me, I meditate. I meditate well, because if sleepiness arises and sleepiness arises, if you fall over, you fall over. Now, I say that and it sounds simple, but I also know that there are times where our emotions pretty much wipe us out, that there's just, it's like a, a demon arises in our consciousness. And because of the way that the practice is instructed is you don't have to be stoic about it that there are times where it's appropriate to excuse yourself. You do that in tandem with the teacher. And to me, talking about Zazen, talking about Shikintaza cannot be talked about without a teacher because it is those, fund those subtle points, the subtle aspects of meditation that we have a tendency to ignore or look away from that we may need the teacher to help introduce us to. Oftentimes left on our own around, around meditation, we create more of a protective practice. We grasp onto the ways of meditation that feel good, that support our ideas, that don't challenge us, that don't scare us too much. But it's when we receive direct instruction from a teacher that we have the support 
And you could say the safety, there's, there's a safety in that to go into those darker areas that the teacher can say, no, that's, that's okay. Keep going. If you can sit with that, keep, keep looking at that. Or the teacher can say, why don't you do this a little bit differently and get those modifications. So that's nice in the, in the sense that while it is a, a practice you have to do for yourself, you don't have to do it entirely alone. And you shouldn't necessarily do that entirely alone. But you find a teacher, you find somebody who actually can use forms to communicate the essence. They, they can use words to introduce you to your own intelligence, your own, um, Trungpa Rinpoche said, introducing you to your world. And that's what a good teacher does, one that is not just trying to get you to replicate an idea or live up to a standard, but to empower you in your own intelligence and your own practice. And as we practice, we begin to see that it's not something that occurs. It's not something that's going to show up in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, four hours, a year, 10 years of practice. It's something that we persist and that we do put some tension as we begin to sit longer. We do begin to put some tension on the identity and the idealism of meditation where we stay in the zendo all day and it is uncomfortable and we leave the zendo when we haven't gotten anywhere. I think one of the biggest disappointments for me was after my first 10 day solitary retreat, I felt really good for a minute. And then I realized I was going to have to do it again and again and again. So there was that initial sense of accomplishment. I did it, I made it through my first 10 day solitary. How many more times am I going to have to do this? And now I'm constantly asking so because on when can I go back in? So in the midst of how we study Buddhism, how we ask questions of Sokazan, how we interact with one another, I think sometimes it can be helpful to remind ourselves of our intention to see through, see for ourselves through this practice. So even the way in which we frame questions or investigate the Buddha's Dharma, is it in a way that helps us to see for ourselves? Some of it's going to be conceptual elaboration, and sometimes that's fun. It can be you can have a lot of fun with the Dharma. But to come back to that idea of how do I work with this to see for myself? How can I work with this in the context of awareness, which doesn't provide the reference point that we're so used to? Are there any questions? Yoka. Yoka Bali, how can I have fun with the Dharma? <laughs> I think there's a lot of ways to do that. I think that I'm I mean just being silly with it, just the free association and seeing where it takes you. I think the frustrating part is when we feel like we have to understand. And I come back to something Unio shared with me this morning from Dogen, where it was um understanding is not primary. And when understanding is not primary, how couldn't you have fun with the Dharma? I mean, it's just so rich. It's so outlandish at times. But I also understand that it's frustrating. And if it's showing up as frustration, that's probably precisely what we need to, to look at and to relate to. But we can also look at what is it that, what position do I take that allows for that kind of tension, that kind of warfare, that opposition? Is it some idea that I, I should know this better? I, I should get this or I should enjoy this? Um, so don't don't abandon the frustration or the tension for enjoying the dharma but it's something that we could consider i think of um dogen is somebody you can enjoy when you just stop trying to understand it the other one that i really enjoyed was yun men just how outlandish he was or Banke, these teachers that um, were just kind of wild and i can say i thoroughly enjoy sokazan i i don't always understand it, but it's it's a different kind of fun. Not always comfortable. Shoto. Shoto bowing with um like some negativity and you, you talk about seeing that position that we're holding that kind of supports that. Yes. 
is that um what is it to see that position could you say say more sort of i guess to share like what comes up for me when i hear that is just to like look at just like a, a conceptual structure but to go in, into it conceptually and i'm wondering if if you were saying that we can see that position more like viscerally or um it's going to show up differently for everybody i can say for me it's more visceral it's like an anxiety it's a distaste and for other people it's going to be more conceptual where you actually have stories in your mind that that say why something is not correct or not the case or this this teaching isn't as good as that teaching so it's it's going to show up for for everybody differently but it's that negativity that arises around the dharma which we want to attribute to this is an indicator i shouldn't have to do this or it's not valid and again there's a lot of subjectivity in this for me because i know before i met sokazan the entirety of my direction in the dharma was all about how i felt i used my feelings what felt good what what sounded good what resonated with what i already felt to be true and that's a difficult way to pursue the Dharma because you're probably going to find that you're just layering on protection. You're layering on defenses. And that's where the teacher can help because the teacher is not necessarily going to just accommodate your preferences. And so Sokuzan says, no, you need to study Bill Waldron. And for some people, they're like, thank you. I, I'm so excited about this text. And other people are like, I can't even get through half a sentence. It doesn't make any sense. So the teacher introduces us to some of those tender areas where it just doesn't feel good because it doesn't resonate with who we think we are and how we think we should function on the path. Thank you. Further questions? Sokaran. Sokaran bowing. <clears throat> you said sit with a still body. that this somehow reflects the intention of the mind? Yes. Is the intention to still the mind by stilling the body? The stillness of the body helps us, and this is something right from Sokazan, to see the movement of the mind. It's not about mirroring that, but it, to me it sets up the condition where we reduce input, we reduce production, we reduce grasping, and we see what continues to persist despite our best efforts. And even in that stillness, we know it can't be maintained. It's not something to be maintained rigidly. Coming back to respecting one's body, you may need to, and you should, you should adjust your posture as you need to, but return to that stillness. So nothing in meditation should be maintained. Maintenance doesn't work. Maintenance inevitably comes apart. And so if our practice is based on maintenance, we're, we're setting ourselves to keep coming apart. Whereas if we don't, set up any standard, the coming apart doesn't contradict the coming together. The maintenance doesn't doesn't contradict the dissolving. So stillness is important as a point to return to as I understand it. And it becomes more and more subtle. I know for a while, even the movement of the eyes, I asked Sokazan about that, where it could hold my body pretty still, but I would notice what my eyes started to do when I would daydream. And he gave me a little bit of suggestion on a little bit of tightening, but not maintaining. I was like, okay, notice that. Bring your eyes back to what's in front of you. Soft gaze in front of you facing the wall. And just notice how when I start to daydream, my eyes literally just kind of start rolling up to the corner of my eye. I notice that when I'm facing out too. If I face out as the doan, how as my mind wanders, the gaze shifts. That's it's curious. I don't know what that is, but it's interesting to begin to see. So returning to stillness, but not maintaining. Yes. So grand bowing. <clears throat> the area I'm curious about is the mind stillness. And I know that's not what you're referring to, but there are a lot of teachings that encourage peace or tranquility as a preliminary practice. Do you find that necessary or important um, i think that that could not be said universally um, for me i think it was very helpful that i spent a few years practicing mindfulness about a year before meeting sokazan 
I needed that. And I've met people that have come here, have never meditated before and instantly connect with Shikantaza. So there's no way to set up that standard of how to do that. What I feel is important Soka Koji can't be everything to everybody. And what it does and what Soka Zan's teachings do are so incredibly direct that the people that need to hear that will continue with it. And we recognize there are so many other places that will accommodate a lot of other different ways of approaching that. So to not modify and going off of your question a little bit, what is happening here? So I think for us, the emphasis on Shikantaza and then the personal instruction on how to modify that is what's important. And I've said that recently to somebody similarly with the way Sofazan teaches is that we as students have an obligation in a sense to clarify the teachings for our practice. We receive a general teaching that comes out to the public and then it's our questions that allow that to be tailored to our personal practice. And so if tranquility is necessary, I think that should be done individually as opposed to universally. And I think there are also times where that should be the primary practice taught. And then you introduce people to Shikantaza on an individual basis. But in a strong monastic setting, um, that seems like a really valuable starting point. Thank you. Mozuku. Mozuku Bowing, I've heard you use the phrase taking an attitude of stillness. What do you mean by that? I don't think that's different to me than when Sokazan talks about intention. It's it's that you may never um, see what we would consider stillness in a traditional sense, but it's the intention that it's the attitude of I'm going to sit here all day. When you go into a block, say, I'm going to sit. I am going to sit here for four hours. Attitude of I'm going to sit here for four hours, and then 45 minutes in, you've got to go pee two hours in you need a cup of tea or a cup of coffee but you return to that it's using reference points to help us on our path to support us on our path was it going as the attitude of stillness also towards the mind or primarily the body it sounds like you're just kind of sorry to me it's it's a very i'm going to come back to the word intention the one that we're most familiar with that Sokuzan uses, and it's just the intention. It's not directed towards modifying anything. It's just the intention. You just intend to be still, and then you watch whatever arises. Mm -hmm. Bowing, do you mean intend for the mind to be still? No, I think that we don't need to do that. I think the body, the body is, uh, that comes out of the primers too. You can't find the mind, but you can find the body. So we start by holding the body very still. Other questions, I can't get it. So, when you when you're bowing, at one point it, it was right after you talked about um, <clears throat> support and safety of the darker areas. Yes, you said something about putting tension on identity. I can't recall exactly what the phrase was, but what is it when we put tension on on identity? Bowing. I can't recall the exact context, but. Coming back to that support and safety, I was referring to Sokazan, the teacher. And I think that the teacher allows us or encourages us to not abandon what is arising so that we don't immediately resolve the tension by shutting down on it, by moving to whatever resolves it quickest. So I think that the teacher introduces us to some of that tension, creates a little bit of discomfort on the path by saying that it's not just about resolving what shows up to actually see what appears to be um, tension, what appears to be opposition, abrasion, conflict. And you have so, so the word tension in this case implies uh, what I would call a negative aspect? No, not necessarily. I think it can show up in any, any different way. I guess one of the ways it shows up is how we oppose the path for our ideas of the path. So in that sense, it has somewhat of a negative con connotation, but also seeing that it's not just us seeing more clearly, oh, I was opposing something I shouldn't have been opposing. It's not that what you're opposing is correct and where you're opposing it, it from is incorrect. 
It's the very belief that this is uh, polarized, that somehow we need to have things in a particular order for us to work with it. And so to me, it's it's much more raw. It's much less conceptual. It's just the the most raw quality of, of emotion, of negativity. Mozuku. Mozuku bowing. Is the intention to be still and watch what moves, setting up a polarity between stillness and movement? Sure. This, uh, a polarity that relatively is occurring all of the time. So that That is... Uh, an inevitable part of our daily experience. So yes, we hold still, create somewhat some sort of a reference point through the body, and then we watch what appears to be movement. Just continue to return to that. That's what I think what I was saying with, we can utilize reference points to support us on the path. It's not just about jumping to, oh, there's no reference points. I can't have any reference points. And we have tons of reference points that, to me, necessary on the path. It's just that we can't rely on them indefinitely. Mozuka Bowing, is, are we trying to align ourselves with stillness in that polarity? I don't really want to answer your question. I don't, I don't blame you. <laughs> so I'm going to start my talk over. <laughs> Just intend to hold still and observe. Where Sokazan said to me, hold the body still, keep the senses open and receive. And whatever that triggers for you, look at that. Whether you think you understand that or don't understand that, how do I do that? And I think that was so helpful for me to not have it resolved initially with Sokazan. It was, it was resolved initially. I just wanted more. And so you should continue to ask those questions and, and try to understand that, but recognize that it's enough to just continue to return to your practice, even when you're not entirely sure what that practice is. We use the body, we can find the body, just continue to return to this. Forever. Hold on. What, I, what are you pointing at when you say uh, or repeat the instruction keep the senses open? I think there's nothing much to that. It's, it's very simple that we're not meditating at the expense of anything. We are not, our meditation does not require. requires a little bit of a circumstance. We need some container. We don't want to have a free for all. But as far as the body mind complex is concerned, it's not at the expense of anything. So just that reminder that if you sit down in this environment and the dog is barking, you know, if, if that can be resolved without a lot of aggress aggression, we can. But it's also the dog's not interrupting anything. The dog is the most important thing that's happening in the room. It's, it's that kind of idealism that we think that we have to create this perfect situation to meditate. And so sight, smell, taste, sound, mind, um, whatever is, is showing up, that's enough. We don't go overboard like so because I said you you're not necessarily going to go to a Grand Central Station and meditate. We want some container, we want some form. But once you've taken that form, just be very considerate of what you begin to fight with because it's not aligning with how you think that should go. You can you can extinguish incense if it's bothering you. I mean, so again, intelligent. You have to be intelligent about it. Divine. What about keeping the sense of mind or thought open? The great thing is that you it's always open. And you can artificially not have it open for a while, but if you continue to practice, you have no say so over what, what arises and what falls. So the sense of thinking, it requires, it requires no maintenance, requires no modification. And so you may not notice how much you're covering up your thoughts until you sit, but you can't maintain that covering up of thoughts if you continue to return. 
I think that's, to me, it, it feels good to know that there's one time during the day where you don't have to have a say so, that we don't have to dive into this intellectual, that really it, it feels like it's enough to continue to return to this form and the instruction, even in not understanding the instruction. I like when Sokazan said his first instruction from Trungpa Rinpoche was like, just sit there. And that doesn't feel satisfying, but that is what we're doing. Because it's not about what is arising in the sense fields. It's you're just sitting there. What what happens when we fixate on a thought or an emotion? The one kind of seems to be central and or like the dog barking, which sure. that one sense seems to be overwhelming. Is there anything to do there? Well, I would look at the overwhelming part. That's that's where it starts to be. It's overwhelming because again, it's contrary, and that's not to mean there's not some sense overstimulation in the senses. That definitely can happen when you can put some earplugs in or close the windows. But when you say what's happening there, when you begin to fixate, I feel that exactly what you're saying is what's starting to happen. You begin to fixate, and then you notice that, and that doesn't need to be resolved. If fixation is arising, then that's what you need to see. Don't have a knee-jerk reaction to not fixate. That, that's that's a very important part of our mind to see. We don't need to be good meditators. So when all the, the garbage begins to show up through our passion, aggression, and ignorance, don't immediately go to resolving that because oftentimes the resolution is just ignorance. It's just covering it back up. So have a willingness to just be in a pile of garbage sometimes to just see how I can't help but continue to dig this rut, to continue to dig this trench. Again, that comes back to a talk from maybe 10 years ago, something along the trenches of the mind that Sokazan gave, and he was just talking about retelling that story over and over and over. And when those are happening, I know for me, it's that's a good time to bring that to the teacher because there may be situationally something to do where you disrupt that a little bit. Maybe you do alternating sense awareness where you flash on to things that you are ignoring in the midst of that fixation. But it's inevitable that we're going to have to look at those those three poisons. Are there further questions this evening? Junshu. Junshu bowing. What is the difference between having a strong intention to practice and just having disappointment when you don't practice as much? What's the difference between the two? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't think there has to be a difference between the two. I don't see where those those are contradictory. They can co-arise. They, they completely co-arise. Even when you do meditate enough, you feel disappointed that you're not meditating enough. Even, even I went into retreat in August and I was like, eight hours isn't enough. I'm going to sit for 10 hours a day. Awesome. Great. <laughs> disappointment. The disappointment is still thinking that some sort of uh, thing will occur if you do it correctly. So if you can, just just continue to return to the intention, intend to sit, have a form to help support the intention to sit, and have some consideration for the disappointment that that also needs to be there. And that may be pointing at something deeper than just a relative letdown. That, that, that disappointment it probably has roots much deeper than any one given situation. And so we include it. Bowing. Does an intention to practice um, look like just having a desire or a want or need to get to the cushion? I don't think so, because I, I can tell you that desiring the cushion or wanting to get to the cushion is probably not going to get you to the cushion, because that's 
very difficult. I feel that the intention for each one of us is, is quite different. A lot of times it's just rooted in the rawness of our suffering that we, we have a sense that there's something more to see. And so we return to the cushion or maybe that inspiration comes from the teacher or teaching or comes from the Sangha. But I don't think it necessarily just has to be wanting to meditate. That's, I know some people that have that, that want to meditate. And uh, I just can say that for me that that has not been the case so much. Do you, do you want to meditate? Until I'm meditating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're alone in that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a final question this evening? You can buy you. Yes. Um, actually, I have two questions. My first question is when I feel like I have difficulty understanding just receive the teaching. The more I hear that, sometimes I feel more frustrated when I cannot receive. Sometimes it could be very simple things. And I lecture myself, I should receive. This is just simple. I can. Because I keep saying and hearing, just receive. So what part I'm doing wrong or how I can understand that, Bobby? I feel that you are receiving the teaching. I think the way in which you're describing that, that for me is the epitome of receiving the teaching because the teaching arises and then you have to look at what it triggers. Receiving the teaching is not just a transaction. It's not the teacher has it and then you receive it like that. So is what well, is I know it's not satisfying. It probably doesn't feel like you're receiving, but to not to not um, abandon that that feeling of frustration. Maybe that's where you start to enjoy the teachings is because you stop trying to receive it as content and you actually just receive the mind, the mind that the, the teachings expose in all of its different forms. So I, I don't think you're doing anything wrong. Thank you, Bowing. My second question is uh, sometimes I feel like when I come to, I do have a strong intention, um, which I, I want to keep it all the time. But a lot of times I come to the cushion is for an outlet of my, my own suffering. And when I, am I saying, so what I'm asking is, is that okay also to come to the cushion? Bowing? Yes, I think that's probably pretty common that I think most of us when we're having, you can tell who's having a hard time. A lot of times if you see them, in the zendo when you wouldn't usually see them in the zendo uh, a lot of us there's something about the the immediacy of our suffering when it's taking on a strong form that reminds us that we probably have more to look at but i don't think that that's a problem if you find yourself sitting more when you're having a hard time if you're getting to the cushion in a sense it's not so important what what it is that's motivating you to get there it's that you are there that you you get there so continue to do that. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We can close for the night. Hi, this is Chiezan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. Sokozan offers these talks without expecting anything in return. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you.